So I like to call people out where I need to. Where is this special book? Uh, yeah, I edit all the videos, I do all of them. And that's part of why I didn't want to do a book. Anything you've ever seen on SBSK, I've edited it directly. I just, I don't know, I feel like such an obligation and commitment to this mission that I don't want to dilute it by letting too many chefs in the kitchen, you know? So back when you were a special education teacher, I know you start each classroom with 10 minutes of giving compliment. Ring, ring, ring. Hello, Mr. Chris. I'm a student today. Joe, I love how you're your authentic self. You say stuff that you know might be controversial, but you express okay, it. I, I don't want to hear anymore. No, I, I, can't, I can't accept compliments too much. What? My love language is being like roasted. Yeah. So that's how I. You're a piece of crap. Thank you. Scum of the earth. Yes. Would you agree with my statement that my disability is a huge hindrance in relationships? When I first started doing that, yeah, it felt like everything was going to fall apart. So here I am, we have 3 million subscribers on YouTube, we have almost 4 million on Facebook, and I think that it's all going to disappear if I take one week off. I was just doing it because I'm like, these stories are important. But through being so dedicated to that cause and mission, we kind of created this catalog which is timeless in a way. The delivery and the length has changed mm -hmm. tremendously. We've gone from like two, three minute videos to now like the average video will be like somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes. So I guess it is changing a lot in a way, and I think there's more depth now than before, because how do you get deep unless you know? And I actually, that's one of my biggest worries with SBSK, is that it's not reflective of the entire disability community, because by our very nature, somebody has to want to do an interview. You have to reach out to me. But I know there's plenty of people out there who don't want to talk about it, who don't want to have their story out there, and I'm like, well, that's kind of troubling. What if people watch my videos and think that everybody always wants to constantly talk about their disability, when in reality, some people probably don't want to talk about it at all. That is something, unfortunately, like a lot of the kids who I've worked with who I care about deeply have passed away. So like oh, getting okay. older in death, I, I've really had to like come to an understanding that it's just inevitable and you just, well, I don't know. How do you know you're close when the family contacts you? Oh, it's heartbreaking. It's hard. I, yeah, there's been times where I've just broken down and, and like, oh man. And I don't know what to do. I like, I feel like I should do something because we have this big community, but I'm like, there's nothing I can do. And then I, I guilt myself. It's yeah. tough. It's a tough situation. This is actually one of the biggest uh, difficulties, obstacles I have in my life. And everybody who like really knows me says this, is that I'm too forgiving with people. And like, I'll let people into my personal bubble yeah. who kind of like walk all over me. And I make excuses for them. I'm like, oh, that's just their person. Hello, welcome to my podcast, to my friend Joe's Tooth. I'm Joe's Tooth, and I'm joined by Chris. Um, it's a special day today because we're actually in the same room. Give me a mic to Chris. He's kind of a big deal. He runs a YouTube channel called Special Books with Special Kids with over 3 million subscribers, 500 videos, and over 2 billion views. That's Seth Bezos levels right to here. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. So let's start with the first question you have ever asked for special books by special kids. Chris, how is it like to be you? It's good, you know, like, as things progress and as things grow, I'm talking about our YouTube channel and the Facebook page, our whole platform, it like slowly becomes your norm. So like, I'm just living how I've always lived. I just kind of, it feels the same, you know? I mean, I don't know. I'm not the one with two million subscribers. Like. It doesn't... I don't feel like it impacts that much, but at the same time, it probably impacts everything. It's just hard to understand. Well, I want to say you are impacting the world. You have, I guess, opened the door for a lot of disabled people like me to start creating your story and just show that there is an audience out there that want to talk about themselves and disabilities that we shouldn't be hidden. And there's an audience out there that will listen to us and appreciate us or not like my video that goes on your channel whenever you release that. Uh, that makes me really happy to hear, thank you. Yeah. So I like to call people out where I need to. Where is this special book? There is no book. So initially, um, False advertising. our origin story, and it's funny because I'll do talks and afterwards people will come up to me and tell me, I love your book. So like they just like, I don't know, I think they're just trying to be my friend. I never say anything, I think it's funny, but um, there is no book, so. Are you thinking of having a book or is it not? No, and actually um, we struggled to find a publisher, so that's why we started the film videos. 
But as things have grown, then all these publishers wanted to publish a book, and they were reaching out, like, can we do the book? Can we do the book? But um, I've realized what an effective medium videos are. So I've realized that I don't want to really spend time writing a book right now because there's just so many important stories, and capturing them on video is much more time efficient than taking all of the months to write a book. Well, some people would do, like, they'll hire a whole team, and then have everything, like, you have the merchandise going on. Not you me. Know, not you, but people would be like, like, get the merchandise going, like, teach your hat, you know, belts. You know? I'm wearing an SBSK hoodie. Um, I think we sold them for, like, three months. Then I'm like, I don't want to do merch anymore. This doesn't feel <laughs> right. So I'm probably one of the only people who owns the SBSK hoodie. Uh, yeah, I edit all the videos. I do all of them. And that's part of why I didn't want to do the book. Anything you've ever seen on SBSK, I've edited it directly. I just, I don't know, I feel like such an obligation and commitment to this mission that I don't want to dilute it by letting too many chefs in the kitchen, you know? Of course. Well, one, it's very satisfying to edit your own video, to watch the interview, do it the way you do it, and then edit it the way you like to do it, because at the end of the day, it's all about you and your style of it, and everyone comes to your channel to see who you are. Definitely. And when I'm editing a video, I'm thinking about everything I've ever learned through all the people I've met. Like, for example, in four months, I might be editing a video and someone said something. And then I remember, wait, I talked to Joe that one day and he was talking about how important that aspect is. I better include that. That's something important to include. So it's almost like I formed this whole encyclopedia of like how to edit these videos over the past seven years. Well, like I've been doing my podcasting for six months now when you're you're seven years into this but you're you have a unique position of interviewing people and then being vulnerable with themselves if you talk to the same amount of people 500 people they're not going to have the same kind of deepness that your video your channel try to create like yeah if you just ask hey how how would you like to be you they're gonna be like oh it's okay i'm working and such but like you come in with this I, it, you want them to unveil the true passions and true humans of themselves. A lot of us keep it on the inside because unfortunately a lot of people don't care about it At, on a public scale. They just care about, you know, what their image is. So they'll like make sure that, you know, you edit this the right way or, well, why don't I like it? Let's edit it out and let me see it this way. Or like, you know, pre-write a script and you have to do it this way and create a character, but you're just you and the person themselves you know i just i was on his video and he let me be myself and i think it was something that you didn't necessarily agree with me and you're like i don't think like, i don't need to agree with you you know how fun would it be if i only interviewed people who went along with like this narrative that everybody has i think it's important and i think the opinions that you articulated that you said were unpopular opinions. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many people have them. And a lot of the opinion, uh, unpopular opinions you said, I disagree with, but that's the beauty of it. Like we have to have discussions, we have to have conversation. And to your point of um, people being vulnerable, being vulnerable definitely isn't like something that's required to have an interview on our ch channel. Mm -hmm. But I think that I've done so many interviews where people are just so open and honest that it almost creates this um, willingness for people to do it. Like they know what they are walking into and they know that there's something they want to communicate. And they think about like, what is it that I've always wanted to say that maybe I've kept in? So I think it's just like having that track record of allowing people to express themselves authentically makes my job easier. I think I'm gonna add to that. I think also people are not given the opportunity to ask questions like that. Like you don't go to a bar or something like, you know, like what would you, biggest challenge in life, you know? Like you talk about, like, what's happening right now is Will Smith smacking Chris Rock. Like, that's what you're talking about in a bar, you know? Isn't it, it's like, it's hard not to talk about that stuff because it's like so, I don't know, it like pulls you in. Yeah. But I don't think it's good for, like, the spirit. I don't think it's good for, like, energy. I've always been bored with, like, conventional conversation. I've always loved, like, the conversation we had today. Because, like, now whenever I think about Joe, whenever I think about Midtown, Midtown Manhattan, we have this memory here. Yeah. And I'd be like, man, like, that was a conversation. That was fun. I don't know about you, but, like, every time I meet a new person and we create a chemistry together, it kind of feeds off of you for, like, a long time. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Like, depending on, I'm sure you have so many that maybe some of them 
didn't hit you as hard as others, but it affects you for the rest of the day. Like some makes you really happy and carries off the rest of your day or even your week. It's funny you say that maybe like some people you don't connect with as much as others. And everybody always asks me, what's your favorite interview? Or like, who's your favorite person? And I'm like, I can't answer that. That's like asking a, like a parent, who do they love the most? And yeah, there's... But it, but I'm going to say... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to add to that. No, no, I want to say that I know you have a favorite in, interviewer, interviewee. You just will never admit it. No, like, I, I actually don't have a favorite, but there's definitely like people I connect with more. And there's yeah. probably like... I don't know, like 20 people who are super, like super, like special to me, who are like family, yeah. but that's not everybody and that's okay. Like I care about everybody. Everybody is my friend, but you're not going to connect with everybody and be your best friend. And it would be inauthentic if you did, you know? Um, I mean, it's your, well, when you're in this job field, you're, you're supposed to connect to them the most because if you don't connect with them at all, it brings onto the camera and you don't want them to be uncomfortable, you want them to share, have a great episode, like you're, you're spending your time and effort to come to their place and interview them, and you just want them to have a good time too, like it's, it's a 50-50, like on well, my podcast, I want you to be comfortable, if you want to take your shoes off, go ahead, like um, do what you gotta do, like this is your podcast, and you can say whatever you want, I'm just here to highlight whatever you, who you are as a person, if you have a controversial opinion, I might leave it in, because that's you, and if I get any email, I'm going to send it right to you. Oh, please, please. I'd love to read it. <laughs> yeah. So back when you were a special education teacher, I know you start each classroom with 10 minutes of giving compliment. Ring, ring, ring. Hello, Mr. Chris. I'm a student today. Joe, I love how you're your authentic self. You say stuff that you know might be controversial, but you express okay, it. I, I don't want to hear it anymore. No, I, I, can't, I can't accept compliments too much. Well, I can tell. I, why can't you accept compliments? Um, one is like I know I'm great, so I don't like hearing you. And then two is my love language is being like roasted. Yeah. So that's how I. Like, You're a piece of crap. Thank you. Scum of the earth. Yes. Trash water. I don't know because everyone can say they're like nice. I don't know. It's like, everyone can say you're a nice person, but like, I don't know. It doesn't even mean so much to me. Yeah, no, I understand. I more like descriptive things about people. Well, a little backstory about the compliments. I taught at a school, which was kind of like, it was, I would, uh, it was a last option for kids who failed in their other placements a lot of the times. So a lot of the kids who I was teaching jumped from school to school. They were kicked out of schools. So the idea of complimenting them every morning was kind of like building up their confidence, which has been shattered over the years. And it worked. It was brilliant to see them. They became more confident. And when you're more confident in the classroom, you're willing to put yourself out there and try things that you might fail at in reading and writing and math. And it just became, it led to more academic success for them and social success. No, I mean, I, I can see that how it worked for you. But like in my case, I grew up, I mean, people would say like they're a great, like people would say like you're a great person, you're funny and then, but um, try to talk to them and they don't want to talk to me again. Like, they don't want, like, um, Chris always, like, how do they like to be your friend? It's like, people are friendly to you, but, like, do they really want to be your friend? I would say no. They'll be friendly towards each other. Yeah, like, I'll get complimented, like, hey, you're a great person, but it also creates a bad, it creates a bad thing for me because then everyone says you're a great person, but if you have no friends, then it's like, are people lying to you? Like, what's happening here? So now it creates, for me, it creates a thing where, like, it comes down to who you are. If I don't think I'm great and you're telling me I'm great and I don't think I'm great, your words don't affect me. But if I say I'm great, your words don't do anything to me because I already know I'm great. I don't need you to tell me anything. And I don't know if it's like a, the concept of it is very weird to me that I think a lot of people that have low self-esteem that they have to be complimented on it. But it's also, you know, the male and female dynamic. Men are not complimented at all, but how come they're able to do all these great things? You know, ask any guy, when was the last time you complimented? You were complimented. They will tell you, like, the guy that did it, what they complimented, so they think they like their shirt. They're going to keep that shirt for the rest of their lives, where women are complimented all the time. But I just tried to compliment you, and you shut me down. Oh, so yeah. maybe there's a reason men aren't complimented. But, like, the thing is that, like, women get complimented all the time, right? But then how come, you know, that if you say they're fat, 
then they become this, they become insecure about themselves. But like men are, but then men can be like, they're told they're bad and they're still able to be strong. So compliments doesn't seem to be enough for some people. So I don't know if it's a male versus female dynamic or is it low self-esteem. Because if you don't have a high self-esteem, you know, all the compliments will not do anything. My personal policy, and I love compliments. I love to just make people feel good. But my compliments are never based on the way someone looks, you know what I mean? It's always just about like the, what they're putting out into the world, their their energy, their vibe, and how how I appreciate that. I find that that's often the best type of compliment. Yeah, well, I think like the biggest compliment I can give someone and people can do is I appreciate your time. You know, everyone can say you're nice. Everyone can say you're pretty. Anyone could say all these things, but like someone giving their time is, I think, is huge. And especially today, it's huge. Thank you for giving me your time. Thank you for giving me your attention. You can compliment someone that is pretty, it's just a sense but it doesn't mean much and that and then... And you know, sometimes it's not even the words, it's the, it's the look. I just interviewed a family and um, afterwards the mom looked at me and she said thank you. But her eyes, like you could tell that mm -hmm. she was genuinely just moved by the day and how much it meant. I think a normal person should accept a compliment and be happy with it. But I think I grew up in a way where people have said nice things to me, but maybe they meant it, but then didn't mean anything to me at, at, the, at the end of the day. So uh, they'd be like, wow, you're a great person. And, said, and I'll text them to like, hey, let's hang out. And we don't hang out. So it's like, you say I'm a great person, but then you don't want to hang out with me. So like, what's the deal here? Like, so now it's like a consistent statement. So like, I think that comes into that. So like, now you're thinking like, is it, are they lying to me? Or is it now, maybe I'm a great person, but I don't have enough that they want to hang out with me. So now it's like, is it my personality? Is it my, it, well, in my case, it would be my personality and it would be like my disability. You know, I spent so many years hating myself for my personality and my disability. You know, I was always trying so hard in relationships and stuff. And I would look at other people and they're putting less effort in these relationships. You know, some were just really shitty to people. And they're getting way more, you know, way more attention, way more relationship and stuff. It's like, what am I doing wrong? Like, and then I started filming myself and I saw my personality. I'm like, wow, I have a great personality. I'm really funny and people laugh and stuff. There's always a little doubt of maybe they're just laughing just because of that. But then I think it comes down to my disability that maybe this, my disability is the one that's turning people away. And I can't change that. So now anything I do in my life, I have to do 200%. I have to compensate for my disability. You know, I think people expect me to say, no, it's not your disability, but what do I know? What do I know how society well, views I, you? How I, could I, I know? I don't know. Well, I also want to get your opinion on it because you also interviewed 500 plus people mm -hmm. and a lot of them in the disability world are, you know, like disability world is huge, there's a huge range, you know, there's some to minor disability, you know, in, invisible disability, very severe disability, you know, some have it for six, a year and then that's it. But then, but then there's people, you deal with people that don't have friends or not able to create relationships. When you interview all those people, would you agree with my statement that my disability is a huge hindrance in relationships? Oh yeah, absolutely it can be. And I think it's a societal issue of modern society's view on disability and understanding of it. And that is part of the motivation for why I do this and interview people because I think there's a major ignorance. Like you said, you've struggled to form friendships despite having a really just positive energy. You're a cool person to be around. Um, I hope that through these videos we can get rid of all that ignorance. But I think it's a group effort. Like I think. Maybe I can push a snowball, but then people like you do videos too, and like we're all adding to the snowball. But to back to your question, uh, yes, I do believe that is an issue in our world. But do you also think that maybe we deserve not to have friends? No, I think you deserve to have friends. Well, not as I expand on the on the question, not deserve. Like I think everyone should have friends, but maybe not deserve in terms of asset wise, because like people want to be friends with people because they bring something to the table. I, I disagree with you. We talked about this on my video. Yeah. I disagree with you. Like I have friends who, I don't know, but they bring something to the table, just being them. That's bringing something to the table. Like 
having an enjoyable presence to me that's bringing something to the table. No, I agree. I agree with you. As, yeah, as I think in this day and age, especially, I feel like when I was growing up, I had to offer something that I want people to stay in my life. Just me being funny and being friendly is not good enough. Well, I think you figured it out that it's being your authentic self that is what you have to offer in the world. Good, but I don't think it's good enough. I think there has to be more to it. Is that part of your desire to make a podcast? Because that's kind of a social value, a, so a social currency, I should say. Um, I, th I think it applies to two things. One is I realized I, I was alone a lot and I needed to make, I needed to, my speech impediment was getting worried because the pandemic was happening and we were all not here. So I had to look for a way to talk. The so podcasting is great because I could talk and get myself better. Two, it allowed me to interact with people. Okay, I know my skill set. I'm able to talk to people well and I have great personality and such and it also feeds my ego of you know I love to make jokes I love to interact with people I love to bounce, bounce back and forth especially if you have good chemistry it really makes me feel good for a long time it's like my high in a way um, it's just very rare to find that person I really vibe with um, and then the other thing is I know I'm funny I know I'm charismatic I know I'm a great person but growing up was never enough for me me being nicer will not help any situation. I can't change my disability, so my concept is let create. Let me create my own brand, so I can create numbers and create assets to the world. So if someone sees me, I have ten thousand subscribers. That's my asset. You know, I can't be rich. I can't really be rich unless I get. I do the GameStop stock and make millions of that. You know, I can't be rich in that kind of way. Open a business and such. Yeah, I have to create something for myself. I look at rappers. You know, some of them are really ugly. If they didn't have any money or any you know, my personal policy, I can't. I don't. Comp I don't talk about people's looks. Oh uh, yeah, not. Well, I'm just saying, like the if you like some of these rappers. Uh, okay, I'm gonna say, and then Chris can say his opinion. Some of these rappers, they don't look good at all. But since they have money and fame, you know, then women talk to them. You get all that. So, do you want my opinion about? forming a podcast for social currency? Um, yeah, sure. No, there's nothing wrong with it. Lots of people no, do it. Do what, do what people do it. I don't, I'm, I mean... No, say whatever you want to say if you don't like... No, that's it. That's it. Like, I don't think there's anything genuinely wrong with that. I feel like a lot of times, a lot of times I log on to social media, I think a lot of it is for social currency. And I don't think you should, like, examine your motives too much as long as your motives aren't coming from a bad place. Well, I mean, it depends how you look at it. Like, so if you say, like, I came onto your podcast for clout, right? And people are be like, he's there for the clout. And I'm like, yes, but no, I'm also being myself. I'm also didn't force myself to be you. You actually came, I put myself on your doorstep, but you opened the door and let me in. Mm -hmm. I didn't like force you to come here at all. Yeah. But I also want to say that I also put the work to come to this place right now. Like, I don't know like what your decision was that I just happened to be in New York City and you just happened to be here. But like, I, like, I liked your earrings. Thank you. I'm joking. <laughs> oh, no. For, for people who don't know, we had a discussion about that on my video, so that will, you'll have the context of it if you saw that. No, I mean, I mean, if you don't like them, that's okay. Uh, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Oh, so you do like them. What? I don't even think about them. I just know that you were talking about them, so I brought them up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but I was just, damn it, now I lost my train of thought. Something about clout and being yeah. on a video. Oh, uh, yeah, but I'm saying, well, like, me making all the videos I have made in the past has made me become a better speaker. So it'd be like, so like all that hard work that I put before will make myself better when I'm on your video. If you did interview me out of the blue and I didn't talk about it, I would not be as charismatic as I was then. I wouldn't be as able to talk as well as I was then. Maybe I wouldn't have the same impact that I do now. So I feel like all the hard work I did before where I only got 10 views, so what? But it had led me to become this greater person and create these relationships, deep business relationships that I never met before. I, I got a job to one of them. I'm now a person that overlooks men speaking group. Okay, that's very hard to find. Someone found, I interviewed someone, and you're like, hey, you're perfect for this. I was like, sweet. This is the same as anything else. Like, if you want to be a runner, if you want to go run 10 miles, you got to start with a step. Exactly. You gotta, you gotta train up to it. It's the same thing with an occupation. It's the same thing with um, anything in life. 
yeah. if you want to make videos that have an impact in the world you have to learn step by step by step and it's yeah. a long and tedious process i know I'm, i've been doing it for like a year and, a half. and there's no end it just keeps going that's the thing i thought there was an end i thought yeah. like there's just this feeling where everything becomes effortless and that's it yeah. it's always hard and tedious but i love it of course like you make one video and you're like wow this is amazing yeah and then you're like the next day it's like Oh wait, next week happening. Yeah, well, but for example, we just did this video and it's amazing. We're having so much fun. Yeah. Then I gotta go catch a flight. Exactly. Then I gotta get a rental car. Then I gotta get a hotel. Like it's. It keeps going. It never stops, and that's part of. I find that romantic. It's like the true definition of romantic. Like there's this appeal to it that's like. It's addicting. It is, and then I'm home and I'm like, what do I do now? And I empathize with people who like struggle when they're at home like i hear about rock musicians and then they get off the road and i always thought how like how can't you just be happy it's hard to be in constant movement and then not i i know you you, you mentioned you mentioned before the podcast that you used to release a video every week and then you stopped mm -hmm. did you feel weird when you didn't upload something yeah well i only i only like took a break once or twice so i still upload a video mostly every week but maybe like every two or three months i'll skip a week when I first started doing that, yeah, it felt like everything was going to fall apart. So here I am. We have 3 million subscribers on YouTube. We have almost 4 million on Facebook. And I think that it's all going to disappear if I take one week off. And that's a fear. I've talked to plenty of people who are making content. Some have way bigger of a following than me. And they all have that fear. That's just part of it. Well, I think, I think you're in a good place because, for one, you're never going to run out of gas. They're going to always give you all these terrible diseases, it's, it's terrible. Um, even the same disease, there's so many variations and different upbringings and stuff. But you're also in a good place to be a YouTuber because, like, if you're a tech YouTuber, you have to be on point every single time. You know, new product are unveiled, got to do reviews on that. You know, if, you know, if you stop for a month or two, someone's going to take your place. In your place, there's not many people that are doing what you do. That no one can really take your place. So you're in the good, you're like on the top of the mountain. You can do whatever you want. And it's funny because I, I was never thinking about that, right? Yeah. I wasn't like, well, let's do it this way because that will position you here. I was just doing it because I'm like, these stories are important. But through being so dedicated to that cause and mission, we kind of created this catalog, which is timeless in a way. Like, I think yeah. these stories will be just as relevant in a hundred years. And yeah, some of the language might be outdated. Some of my methods probably from seven years ago are already outdated, mm -hmm. but even that has relevance because you can see how things have progressed. So yeah, I do think the videos are timeless and there's a benefit to that. that t it takes some of the pressure off of me. I mean, you also have a very simple formula. So like, you know where you're getting yourself into every single video. So like when you go on YouTube and you click on one video, you know, and then you reload YouTube and then all the other video, but you kind of know who Chris is and it's all the same style of it. Do you notice I wear the same shirt in almost every video? Yeah. Well, it's does. not that I have like 10 of these, but it's the same style shirt. Do you do it on purpose? Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know that first. I don't even know if it's for me or if it's for the audience, but it's just comforting. I'm a man who like, once Wait, I find something are that... You in, it's weird that you brought it up because you also, I don't think you realize about color theory. Blue is a very common color. Mm -hmm. That's not why I started wearing, maybe subconsciously is why I started wearing it. But I literally just went on the Amazon and typed in like V-neck sweater and this was like 15 bucks. But with inflation, it's like 20 something now. <laughs> I, I might be going out of business pretty soon. Yeah, like my, like my walls in my room are blue. Yeah. It's a calming color. It is. It, it's definitely calming. But, but um, I think, like I said, the videos are kind of timeless in a way. Of course, I, yeah. I think wearing the same thing in every video, like we could watch the video we filmed that's current. Yeah. And then the algorithm... Um, it recommends a video from six years ago and I'm wearing the same thing. <laughs> so it almost makes it like no, no time has passed and everything is just as important as the day it was released. I mean, you have a very simple formula that's hard to like change, but you ever thought of changing things around? Or yeah. just like the way everything are? I honestly, and this might be to my detriment, because they say you're always supposed to be changing and evolving. Yeah. And in many of my, as in many aspects of my life I am, like personally, um, physically, the way I look at life, like I'm always trying to evolve. Yeah. But when it comes to the interviews, I don't really think about changing much. 
the format, the delivery and the length that's changed mm -hmm. tremendously. We've gone from like two, three minute videos to now like the average video will be like somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes. So I guess it is changing a lot in a way. And I think there's more depth now than before because how do you get deep unless you know the proper swimming technique? I don't know, that's probably a corny metaphor, but you have to have years of experience before you can ask the questions that really take it to that level. It's also a very simplistic approach. All you do is asking, what, who are you? Like, what, and you can't change those questions. Like, but we also have to thank the people that have become vulnerable. That's it. And that's the big thing. Like, and you're always hoping they become vulnerable, but you don't know they're, you have, like, when you're talking to these people, they have to be in a good mindset to be able to talk to you. Like, because, you know, some of these things are very traumatic moments for them. And, like, like I, I, I like to ask questions that are very, like, deep into them. But sometimes I feel like maybe I'm going too deep. I don't want to trigger their feeling because sometimes when you're talking, it triggers me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm mentally fine and everything, but I think I always have trauma in my life. And it triggers me sometimes at the end. I have to, have to like, take a deep breath and, like, stop for a while. So, like, these people are... Mentally, do you do you ever worry about people's mental health when you talking to, when you're talking to them in a way? Absolutely, and many times I'll ask them. So, oh, let me think of an example. Maybe somebody talks about a particular symptom of schizophrenia that I know is really just tough for them, and it can trigger them. So, if that's the case, I'll ask them. Hey, is that okay if we talk about that? Do you want me to ask you questions about what that's like for you? And if they say no, then that's it, I'll edit it out. But I usually edit that question out of me asking them if it's okay if we talk about it, mm -hmm. and it just proceeds into them talking about it. But honestly, I don't think I've ever asked somebody, is it okay if we talk about this? And they said no. And I think that's kind of selection bias, because people who reach out for an interview wanna yeah. talk about things. Sure. And I actually, that's one of my biggest worries with SBSK, is that it's not reflective of the entire disability community because by our very nature somebody has to want to do an interview you have to reach out to me but i know there's plenty of people out there who don't want to talk about it who don't want to have their story out there and i'm like well that's kind of troubling what if people watch my videos and think that everybody always wants to constantly talk about their disability when in reality some people probably don't want to talk about it at all so that's something on my mind well, it's kind of weird because, like, in the social media world is that a lot of people like to advocate for themselves, but they actually don't want to be in a conversation about it. You know, so they'll be mm -hmm. like, hey, I have this really bad moment, and, stuff, and people want to talk about it, and, stuff, and like, ha ask for advice, but then they don't want to talk to that person. So, like, I, mean, I know one girl with, like, no trauma dumping here because, like, they're dealing with their shit, and they don't want to hear other people's shit. And I think it's fine for me it's fine for like me to be on a podcast to hear other people talking about themselves, but I cannot, one of my triggers is trauma dumping on me. I'm okay if people like come to me and want to be helped and such, but I can't, you can't complain to me and then not do anything about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'll understand, I'll be there, I'll hold your friend to the bottom and stuff, but it's all about you and you have to one, pick yourself up and put yourself back together. I mean, this, this work is at times incredibly stressful doing online advocacy, and I don't think it's just particular to disability advocacy, I think any type of advocacy, for an extended period of time, it's stressful. And I see accounts of younger people, like maybe in their 19s or 20s, and they get a big following, and I love it, because they're posting such important things. But so many times, I see the pressure get to them, and it breaks my heart, because I think they were doing such pivotal work. But at the same time, I understand it. I'm like, like what you're saying, I felt it too. And I wish I could have a conversation with them. I wish I could be like, this is how I coped with that struggle. But I really understand when I see that, when I see somebody let the pressures of adv advocacy get to them, I understand that it can be tough. Yeah, like you're dealing, well, the thing a lot of people, like maybe, I don't think maybe you don't realize it, but when you have a mental disability, you're dealing with that on top of life. And then now you have someone coming into your life, dumping their trauma to them. Like for you, you might be okay because you're not dealing with the, any of these problems really. You're just a healthy 25 year old. Hold up. 33. Oh, okay. Earlier this month. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do 25 here. No, that made me feel good. Uh, yeah, I'm, ha really? I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. I'm about to turn 30, and it's like, did you see the Bill Berman movie? 
What one? I call it deep, not... I call it upside, I think. I call it inside? No, no, I haven't. Uh, so oh, wait, Bo Burr? Yeah, I saw that on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you do kind of look like him right now. Oh, uh, do I? A little bit, He's, yeah. he's cool. That's a compliment. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, the song Turn is Dirty. I don't rem I remember the, all of the songs were brilliant. I don't remember, like, what one was what one. Um, he, yeah, he did have one that turned 30. It's like, shit, I'm going to be 30, turning 32. And I'm, like, traumatized by it. It's so old. It's different for everybody. I don't, I don't know. It's like, everyone said you, like, enter a whole different age of sorts. Like, this, is, this is a topic, because we talked about death in your video yeah. and death is something unfortunately like a lot of the kids who I've worked with who I care about deeply have passed away so like oh, getting okay. older in death I, I've really had to like come to an understanding that it's just inevitable and you just well, I don't know how do you know you're close when the family contacts you oh it's heartbreaking it's hard I yeah there's been times where I've just broken down and, and like oh man and I don't know what to do I like I feel like I should do something because we have this big community, but I'm like, there's nothing I can do. And then I, I guilt myself. It's yeah. tough. It's a tough situation. So you, so you feel like when you go to the interview, you kind of have a moral obligation that they unveiled a, a like deep part about their lives and now you have this deep connection that it's almost a not healthy relationship. Oh, it isn't. It isn't because it would be healthy if it was a one-time thing. If I met one family and we formed a deep connection, and then I felt like I had to be their friend. That's healthy. That's good to have a friend. But it's not healthy when I feel that same level of commitment and I've done a thousand interviews. Because that's impossible. Well, I think it's traumatic just because when you start a relationship based on traumatic events, then it's not healthy at all because now you're just building up on trauma. And it's... And then like, you come to these interviews and you want them to unveil their darkest moments and it's not... It's great. I, gotta, I gotta disagree with you there because I don't want them to. It's just many times that's what people want to discuss. But anyway, sorry, I just, I, I really had no, to say no, that. I, I, I get it. It's just, it's not healthy to start a relationship based on, on, um, on trauma. Because like, you don't go to, so you don't go to like a bar and then everyone always goes, they always meet that person, they're spilling too many secrets out, and they're just like, oh my god, like, you did too much. Like, you don't want to talk about Will Smith and Chris Rock and not talk about you and your marriage problems or something, you know? Yeah. Like, you want light topics and such. But, you know, you, you created, like, I'm a new person, but you created a, like, where so anyone could have watched your video and go, oh, this is what Chris does, this is the question you have. They probably got the same five questions. Um, but yeah, that's, but that's his formula that you're going, like you said, like everyone signs up wanting to talk about themselves mm -hmm. and want to be, uh, want to just showcase who they are. And I think everyone wants to be interviewed. Is it no one wants to interview them or like, well, you also can't be like, can you interview me, please? Not to you, but like a regular person. Just, yeah. Or like ask questions or like also the questions you do ask are question you ask in a relationship, but you ask like months when you get to know each other. You, mm -hmm. know? you know, when you're more comfortable, you're more comfortable in a relationship, you know, that date won't walk away. The last thing you want is, you know, you unveil your darkest moment or like, um, I'm just gonna walk away and it's like, don't talk to me anymore. You know, like it's, yeah, this is, people love it, but not a normal relationship way to start it. Again, it's also not healthy because like I, I see in the podcast too, and I'm used to it right now. But sometimes I'm just like, I wish people ask me questions. I wish the relationship was more fifty fifty. Okay, all like in your video on my podcast, we're asking the questions. You're not getting to know who you are. Like, what do you like to do for fun? Oh, you mean me? No, I'm just saying like a question like that you asked for them. I struggle with that. How much do I want the audience to know about me? Yeah. Because, um... Well, not even I always the audience, want... but just for yourself. Like I mentioned in my video, I remember that we were saying that your happiness is fine because you don't... Like you have, like you're in a relationship, you have a healthy relationship. So you don't need people to ask you that. But people that are disabled now, my friend, they love being answered all the questions. But maybe sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't know that to ask you a question, 
or it's also a pocket. It's also a video. It's a it's a work relationship. I'm all, you know, you're both asking questions. You get your video. You shake hands. We move on. Well, like, you know, like if your like if your self esteem wasn't good, it gets to you because now you're getting, you're creating these great relationships relationships with these people, but then you're just like you're putting yourself out there, but then you're getting nothing in return. But now do that 500 times, and they're just like. I want someone to ask me questions like, what is it like to be your friend, you know? So like, what is it like to, so how, how do I become friends with you? With me? Yeah. I think all of my friendships in my personal life, I hate when people ask me that question. <laughs> I had to get you back. That's what he said to me. But um, all of my friendships in my personal life are based on the love of similar activities. Mm -hmm. Like I love to play volleyball. So most of my friends are volleyball players. I play video games sometimes. So I have my video gaming friends. I love to run, so I have my running friends. I like to play board games, I have board game friends. So I think like I'm in a really good relationship with Alyssa to where I get a lot of like my my uh, fulfillment that way. Yeah. So a lot of my friendships are based around activities. And I value the friends, like we're really bonding when we do those activities. And also I'm not a big like bar guy or drinker, so I think a reason for the activity based friendships is because I don't like to do a lot of like... Right, so I'm going to challenge you, so I remember when we were talking on your video, how to be friends, and like you were saying, like everyone wants to be friends with you and be friendly and stuff. And I was, and my argument was that being funny and caring and you know nice is good, but like it's not good enough because you you did prove my point that all your friendships are around activity. Mm -hmm. So let's say you don't have the activity anymore, are you still gonna be friends with them? Well, I think you could find an activity with every anybody. You could. Both like drinking a cup of coffee. You could both like something you could do in a shared proximity. Deep conversation. But that, that, but it, there has to be a commonality to it. Mm -hmm. You can't just be nice to someone and you're just gonna be friends with each other. You know, there has to be a, some. So like our, I guess our big commonality would be filming. Yeah. The big one. Well, I think what you were tell me if I'm correct here. What you were saying is that in order for there to be a friendship. There has to be a value the friend is providing. Yeah. I would disagree with that. And I understand what you're saying that, um, well, if my, fr if my friendships are all activity-based, that's the value. That's the value I'm getting. Yeah. I have friends who I just meet and have a conversation with, and that's it. And we go back, back to our lives. And I think the value... Or I think the confusion is, I am not going to be best friends with everybody. I mean, but there has to be a connection. I there mean, a, it's a rarity for someone to be friends with and care about each other and such. Like, I have my best friend, and honestly, we have a lot of differences in our lives, and I'm just surprised we're best friends as we are. This is actually one of the biggest uh, difficulties, obstacles I have in my life, and everybody who like really knows me says this, is that I'm too forgiving with people. And like I'll let people into my personal bubble yeah. who kind of like walk all over me, and I make excuses for them. I'm like, oh, that's just their person. They, they, you know, they don't know. That's how they grew up. And um, everybody tells me that. But like I just like I see everyone as a friend in a way. But that doesn't mean I make time to like you know see them every week. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I get. I don't want to seem like oh we don't talk for a week and then like friendship over. I get everyone has their you know like levels of caring the relationship. Some can be not friends for, they won't talk for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But like, I think in terms of like, if we're not talk, like, for example, weddings, if we don't talk for a couple of years, why should I invite you to the wedding? And you know what's extra tricky these, these, uh, in this current age, what constitutes maintaining a friendship? So like, say I leave here, I'm like, hey, let's stay in touch, let's be friends. And let's say I send you an Instagram DM once a month. Is that enough to maintain the friendship? Like, what does it take to maintain a friendship these days? Uh, I think it's, it's just like a personal touch. So like if you post on Instagram, you know, that's for everyone. But if you like send me pictures of like, hey, I did this. That's a personal touch that you want me to know what you did. Mm -hmm. I think it's a personal touch or sending memes that today's. I love know, memes. I love me a good meme. Yeah, like that's cheesy, but that's like purposely chosen meme, thought of you, sent it to you. There's that personal touch. If I did post on my story, that's not really personal. And then, I mean, all the friendships are also different too. You know, some need a constant maintenance of it, some do not. But you also have to consider, like, like they've been levels of best friends. I had, like, a best friend, and, like, you know, like, I went in a hospital. He didn't visit me in a hospital. Does that make him a good best friend? No. And then, like, I cut him out. 
it was weird because he was dating someone. The weird thing is that he was dating someone for like eight years, but he never talked about her that much for eight years. And we were best friends. How is that possible? Um, so like, he cheated on her at the same birthday party, and that was really shit. And then, you know, now we're going through a really traumatic moment with my my flare, and I was on bed rest, and she hit me up and like, hey, I'm. You know, like when she was going through a bad time, like, hey, I offered like an olive branch, like, hey, if you ever needed something, just let me know. And then, you know, we never talked again. Mm -hmm. And then when I was on bed rest, you know, she offered me the olive branch and, you know, I said, yeah, sure, like we started talking and then she came over one day and just stood there by my side. So I got better and then now we're great friends now. Good. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a rare thing, but like, I'm secure in a relationship where I don't have to talk to her for a moment and we'll be fine. But there has to be like, but like every time we do meet, our relationship is strong. But like people will be like, we don't have to talk to each other all the time. But yeah, but when we do talk, I want to have like a solid friendship. If we hang out and you're on your phone, that means you don't appreciate the friendship as much. That's one thing about me. If we're together, I won't be on my phone. I mean, it's different if I'm at home and I'm with Alyssa, who I'm with every day, you know, I might be on the couch on my phone. Oh, yeah. But if it's a friend who I don't see every day, I'm never going to, like, I might look at the time, but that's it. I'm not on my phone. Yeah. That's that's something that, like, I make a, a strict effort to be sure yeah, of. Yeah, I would literally, like, hang out with my friend, and she was like, we were all saying people suck and, like, you know, ghosting and all of that. And, like, people would be like, you know, people don't make time with each other and they're on their phones all the time. Guess what they were doing? I have, like it was in my blog, I have it on tape. They were on the phone most of the time. At the same time, these apps and social media are just made to be so addicting. So I, I agree that like we shouldn't be on our apps, but at the same time, they're made to just do that and hook people. So I try to like understand, man, like their brainwaves are being messed with yeah, it. They did, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna agree with your friend, you're too forgiving. Yeah, see, I am, <laughs> I, I know I am, I know I am. But it's just, it's just disrespect to the person. like. We plan to be together at the same time. I appreciate, I, I guess I come from a different place because I was in places where I was alone a lot. So I really appreciate people that make the effort to see me and stuff. And especially in my case where I'm disabled and stuff. I don't have opportunities like that. So I really appreciate whoever comes into my, into my life. But at the same time, I also have to have a certain level of respect from their end too. Like we're together, I want to spend time with you. Like mm -hmm. if you don't want to spend time with me and spend it with the person, do that. Don't. You know what's been so difficult for me is that since I started SBSK in 2015, time, like the concept of it, has changed so much for me. Um, like every day is a big trip, every day, and it just, the years go by so fast. So like literally, years have gone by and I like didn't make a, an adamant effort to go and see my best friend. Because yeah. he lives up in Philly where I grew up and I'm down in Florida. And I'm like, man, I haven't seen him in years. And it goes by so fast. I'm sure everybody's life as you get older, I know they say it goes by faster. But when you're always on the move and you're always going to a new city, it's hard to process how quickly it moves. Well, effort is sexy right now. What's that? Effort is sexy right now. Oh, I know. It is. Yeah. And I, I started making the effort. I realized that time isn't going to slow down. So unless I make that decision deliberately and consciously, it's it's on me. Yeah, especially if they're a good person, you really want to spend time with them. A lot of you people are not that great, mm -hmm. or they're decent, but like, it takes a long time to create a friendship where trust is involved. You know, the longer you're in a relationship, the more trust is tested. Yeah. And it's hard to find those people. Actually, I called up the guy and we went out and we had a talk. I actually told him everything I just said. I'm like, hey, I've like really lost track of time there. And like, I understand we haven't really seen each other the last decade and that's on me. And like, I just want you to know that I think about you all the time. Yeah. I, I kind of had that with a friend and I was like, but then we haven't talked that much throughout these things. And it's me. I don't know. I get, I did like them enough that it didn't feel right that our relationship wasn't the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But it also came to the point where like, if I talked to them, they were too busy all the time, so like, why should I not be busy for you? Yeah. And it's like, you have to reciprocate somehow. I have here, you became first a special education teacher and did an interview with the kids and you got the permission. But you got the parent permission to release it on Facebook. When did you realize that you were like, whoa, this is something big? Our big break came six months after SBSK started when ABC World News did a story on us. and. 
they uploaded it to their Facebook page and the video had like tens of millions of views. Then it was on the nightly ABC World News across the country. Okay. And that was that was just such an incredible experience because I had never like received a lot of attention for it, anything. It like, was a high, right? It, yeah, it was. It, it's literally a high because your body produces endorphins and I don't think that's a good thing. And you have to learn to manage that if you're going to do this over the long term. But that was that was the first big break was ABC World News doing a story. And we went from a few thousand followers to like 150,000 within that week. So I have here in 2016 you pursued a SBSK full time. What was going through your mind? Scared, excited, world domination? <laughs> I would say people would be surprised by how laid back I am. So I just left my job and I was like, okay, I'll try this. And if it works out, it does. If it doesn't work out, then I can always teach. I love teaching. So I just thought it was a cause that needed attention. I thought it was something that could make an impact on society. And I gave it a shot. I didn't put too much thought into it. I actually don't put too much thought into anything besides these interviews. <laughs> but like the grand scheme of thing I'm talking about. Yeah. I don't think, where's SBSK going to be in a decade? I, I just think... How are we gonna make this video good today? Well, things about YouTube that you're always making money no matter what you do. So you go to sleep, you're making money. Yeah. That's how I think about it. Like you go to sleep, you're making money. You're doing an interview, you're making money. Like when you're a teacher, you don't make money. You're just like you do your job and then you go. Mm -hmm. like you could literally retire and not work a day in your life, you know. Oh no! I your, think your I, videos are so timeless. I think the algorithm favors people who are uploading um, constantly, though. I feel like if somebody was to stop uploading, even if they had popularity in the past, and now this is just based on hearsay, Yeah. but um, I feel like once you stop uploading, the algorithm stops favoring you. Are you afraid you. of that then? I used to be. I honestly really used to be, but now I've realized there's absolutely no, no um, reason to put attention or effort into that because I can't control it. The only thing I can control is making videos and meeting people and asking the questions that just have an impact on things. So we're both in the same niche of rare diseases and chronic illnesses. Was there ever a disease that you read or saw and you're just like, what the app? And you can't <laughs> use my disease as an example. No, I never. I don't know. Uh, uh, that's such a funny question. Um, no, no. Uh, and I've been doing this so long, it's hard to think about like the original year or two when everything was still so new to me. I'm sure there was stuff like I had to adjust to because when you're not used to something, you know, it's it's new to you. But now, seven years into this, I don't know, I don't think like that. Everybody just kind of like is a person to me and that's about it. Mm -hmm. But yes, there is an adjustment and that's why I think the videos are important because representation leads to exposure, which leads to normalizing things. So there are no disease that really like shocks you when you first read about it? Define shocks. Well, it's just like, so like my disease is not something you would expect to be, that exists ever. When I hear shocks, I think about like, or like somebody a, clickbaiting something in like a really just non-ethical way. Oh yeah, more like, I can't believe this disease actually exists. Yeah, I mean, you, you hear some stuff and you really just wish you could do something because it causes nothing but pain for a person. Yeah. And that's something about how diverse the disability community is. A lot of the times um, people promote acceptance and that's great and that's the best way to go. But a lot of the times people are in pain their entire lives and those people desperately want a cure because their whole life has been physical pain and suffering. And those are the conditions which um, they don't shock me. I wouldn't say shock's the right word. But I have an elevated sense of empathy for those people, and I wish that their their time on Earth was pain free. Do you ever worry about the aftermath of these guests with the new huge exposure, and if they can psychologically handle it? So, like when I get a video going viral, and in your case, just a regular Tuesday, I get a high of all this attention and pe people caring for a day or two, then it stops. So, like these people go from having no friends to a whole lot and most probably not again, it creates a huge hole and almost feel worse than before the new 15 minutes of fame. We'll never ever be able to experience again. I look at celebrity act out to get the attention or spotlight back on them. Are you ever worried about that? Yeah, I do worry about the impacts of uh, social media attention and how, how it can affect somebody. Because I know that this stuff really isn't that healthy. 
having a large amount of ten attention virally on you isn't always a good thing. It can it can mess with your mind. But at the same time, getting these videos and representation out there is such a great cause. So how do you balance those two things? Mm -hmm. um, I find that a lot of the people I interview aren't really in it for social media followers. They don't really, it's not a big thing to them. But yeah, of course, sometimes people get 10,000 new followers in a week and it's something that just creates so much endorphins in them. And then when that trickle slows down, it can be deflating. So I just try my best to be transparent with people. Um, I don't tell everybody beforehand, like this is what's gonna happen because you never know how a piece of video will, will be treated by the algorithm. But if I see somebody getting a lot of followers, I'll reach out and say, hey, do you have any questions for me? Like anything you wanna know, anything I could help with? And I just try to be there as a resource for people. Yeah, so, so you're saying that you don't really tell them that you should be careful about the new influx of followers because just as a warning or even to the parents because... Well, there's no guarantee. Funny. There's no guarantee there will be a lot of followers. I've done lots of interviews where the people didn't get that many followers. So I feel like if I was to... Um, you don't want to raise your expectation too high. Exactly. I don't want to create a great expectation and then not deliver. Yeah. Because that could be just as painful as getting something and then seeing the the impact of that not be as high as the initial. Yeah, that's a difficult situation to be in because you want to help them, but you also don't want to hurt them either. It is. And honestly, it's something that I thought about a great deal. It's not something anybody's ever brought up to me, though, that I've interviewed. I don't know how much it actually impacts people, but it is something I try to I try to do my best to manage. Well, I just think that the psychological part of it really affects people. It affects me. Like, like when you first messaged me, I was shaking a little bit because it's like, oh my god, a guy and he's just he's following wants to interview me, and like, I can't imagine someone that you know, like I'm friendly with people, I get to know people, and that's so, like I get them a little more used to it. But these people have, don't talk to people at all, and then all these people are really nice and stuff. So I'm always worried about people taking advantage of them, or they'll go to a bad thing, or they'll give all their money away, or even bad thing, they'll send naked pictures of themselves. But, you know, like people, not everyone has good intentions. So I'm always worried that they just don't know how to handle it, or they just go at it the wrong way because they don't have the experience. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a very valid concern. And it's one that like I create every single safeguard possible mm -hmm. to just create a positive experience for these people. So let's talk about censorship. YouTube has started this program to disable comments on channels where there's high risk of predatory comments. It really affected your mantra of, hey, here's this person living, thriving, and want to be friends. Then you bring it to millions of people so they can friend each other with the comment section and 2019 being disabled. Was there ever a chance of YouTube being right? To due to these kids and adults not knowing the evil that exists in the world where a lot of disabled people experience on a weekly basis. For example, devotees or people who are attractive to people with disabilities. Or some of these people are not fully aware of how evil and manipulative people can be. So are you asking me if do you think if I think that's YouTube's motive to protect people from that? Yeah, do you think they were somewhat right, or do you think that there was automatically... I don't know, I think it's everything always boils down to money. And there was a controversy on this other side of YouTube um, of people being predatory, nothing to do with our videos, and then that just trickles out to every edge of YouTube. So I think we were just caught in a firestorm. It wasn't anything specific to us. And yeah, it stunk. I, it, created a lot of mental turmoil in me for a long time and really? it would be random like initially it sucked but we were without our comments for like two years like randomly it was a long time too. two years randomly like 14 months into it i'd wake up in bed at like 2 a.m and i'd be like so angry about it and like uh -huh. i wouldn't be i never let it go i didn't let it show because there was no benefit to that well, you made a crying video so you really yeah you really poured your emotion out there i had to and that's what i figured that was raw that was as soon as it happened but after I put that out there, I'm like, I've literally done all I can. There's no point of just constantly talking about it. So it was something that bothered me all the time, but I said my piece and I just continued well, now on. You, now you can say that you don't have to worry about the comment section because there was none. I will never, uh, I will never say I don't have to worry about YouTube's decisions because they can decide anything at any point. Yeah, that's what made it a little scary. They're able to get out of the censorship or like, I remember you had a, a bird with them and they censored that video. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
They censored a lot of videos that I don't even bring up because I'm like, this is... <laughs> it would be like 20 videos. Yeah, it's mental health videos. Anybody talks about an eating disorder. Um, yeah, there's just certain topics that I don't know. No, it's just difficult because, like, for one, it's, you have kind of a moral responsibility. And you, we don't have a rating system, so, like, you kind of have more responsibility. What is the line of what you can show? So, like, the burn victim, for example. You know, in itself, it's pretty traumatic for any regular person. But at the same time, you are not... You put it up there, and it shouldn't be YouTube that allow you to not have the video. Mm -hmm. like the video is there, people want to see it. If they don't want to see it, then that's fine. But it's like, it's always the complicity, like in my case. So I have a weird disability. My disability is not a comfortable body to be in. And that's, that's a blanket statement. Like you can, I don't like this whole movement, like everyone pretty and all that. I don't think everyone is pretty and beautiful and stuff. I think my body really ugly. That's fine with that. That's just, that's what it is. Like, and so I always have like, you know, like when I go to the beach, you like take picture, you know, sure, like I put, keep a shirt on because you know, no one wants to see my body. It's amazing and it's horrifying and it's the bad part of society. Everyone wants to see like a beautiful person, but not me in a shirt or on Instagram. Like sure, I post a picture of me naked. Like when I post a picture of me, I'm completely naked and the only thing I'm hiding is, is my dick. I'm like the way I turn my body, you don't see it, but like you see my whole body and I'm okay with it. I mean, I'm sitting on it for a while, but like, well, it's okay for me to post it. You can, maybe they don't want to see it. And it's always conflicting, like, do I do what I want to do and people can unfollow? But do I also have more obligation that I, maybe I shouldn't do it just because people shouldn't need to see it. I think it's up to you. People are posting everything these days. I don't think there's any right or wrong. I don't, I don't know. It, it's a conflicting um, problem. It's just like, is there a line that we shouldn't cross? What I think about is, well, when it takes, when it comes to something like Zaid, the burn victim who they censored, that's his every day. He goes through life like yeah. that. So I think that should be out there because it helps people understand that there's someone out there like that. And if you see him, this is how he wants to be treated because he articulates that in the video. So that allows him to have a more accessible and positive life because now people in his community understand who he is, what he is, what he likes, how he likes to be treated. Um, the things I do think about, and these aren't even things that are bad, but like, you know, I, I was talking to somebody and they talked about how um, because of their disability, they struggled to find employment and then they had to live in places where people were doing drugs and shooting heroin. And I had a thought, well, I know kids watch our videos. Should I edit out that part about heroin? So a lot of when I edit things, it's to do with, I know children watch the videos. But at the same time, I, I don't like to edit too much because it's important for these stories when to be- you do the, When you um, upload a video, do you put this is for kids or not for kids? Not for kids. So you edit the video saying it's not for kids, but you also edit it so it is for kids. Well, I edit it for everybody. Yeah. I definitely, because I'm editing it for adults too, and that's tricky. Because there's definitely some of our videos I'd be like, I don't think kids should probably be exposed to this yet. Yeah. But you know, I trust parents and I make it very obvious. Like if it's a video of somebody talking about something that kids might not be exposed to, I'll probably put that in the title. Not not like don't watch this with kids, but I'll put the topic we talk about in the title. Mm -hmm. So that way it's right there and parents can make the decision whether they want their kids to watch it or not. I, I was thinking like with my videos, if I should put like a... TV 14 rating or something, mm -hmm. kind of like just hey, this is what's gonna happen. Like, because like I'm a new person, so like they don't know what kind of content. So I'll just drop like the f bomb, and they're like, oh my god. I think there's a lot of YouTubers doing that without putting out content warnings. Before I take a mic away from you, is there anything you want to say? Come out any words of wisdom? Words of wisdom. Um, like it's all yours. Yeah, this is funny because I always feel like there's nothing, nothing. Uh, of value I can share when I'm asked questions like that, but I think that might be the thing of value I can share. Um, is, I mean, you have a unique, unique perspective of so many, meeting so many people on a deep level that maybe you're able to group everything into yourself and yeah. your values. Well, that's what I said, but th that I don't like think that highly of myself and I don't think that there's anything I can offer that other people Do can't. you want me to compliment you? For oh, no, no, I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> it's this. We're about to go on a trip together, get in yeah. the car. So, um, 
even in the beginning I felt that. I felt that like there was nothing unique about me, but I acted anyway, and I saw something that I thought was important. So I guess my what I would want to share with people is even if you don't think you're the best, if you have a vision that you think is important in this world, that could be your thing. Like you could act towards something you care about, something you want to bring to society. And even if you're a little awkward, you feel, or you feel a little anxious putting yourself in a new situation, it doesn't matter. You just have to do something you care about and maybe get a little better each day. Okay, well, thank you, Chris, for listening. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Thank you, Chris, for coming on to the podcast. Everyone knows who he is. Um, all the links will be in the description below. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching, and I'll see everyone next time. Bye. Later.